I'm Doug Sweetser. The title of this talk was Tensors versus Tensors of Rank Zero, aka Quaternions, given at the 22nd Eastern Gravity Meeting in Dartmouth, Massachusetts in June 2019. Actually, that wasn't the title I gave at the talk, and I said, well, the title's kind of not quite right. I'm not sure this one's right either, but I also said, you know, I don't even have a slide devoted to what a quaternion is, because it's not that important. Instead, if you happen to know what a complex number is, well, that's basically what a quaternion is. So complex number, you can add, subtract, multiply, or divide. And there's this imaginary factor called I. And the difference between a complex number and quaternions is that quaternions have a J and a K. And because they now have three of these imaginaries, you can do the cross product. So it's complex multiplication uh, plus uh, cross product, and that's it. So we've got the familiar, for that audience at least, uh, Minkowski space-time diagram there, where the zeros are on the diagonal, because that's where dt squared minus dr squared equals zero. And we have the hyperboles there that show uh, the Lorentz symmetry of Minkowski space-time. And then we have this green graph, which I don't think like anybody is familiar with. It's just that one, the other one, rotated by 45 degrees. And as a matter of fact, that's kind of the only way I thought about it until this presentation forced me to say, yeah, no, what's really going on there? And I think this is energy and momentum space, the affine space, which means it's got changes in time only and changes in space only. So if the change in time factor is zero, well, that's like having energy zero. So there's no energy involved in this system. And in that case, it'll be things that happen will all be on the horizontal line. If there's kind of no momentum going on, dr equaling zero, then you're talking about the vertical line. And so if you now have uh, something that's not zero, well, it can't cross uh, the zero, you have to make hyperboles, and wow, that's why you're 45 degrees to the other one. But I believe it's in this particular graph that uh, the, the things we call gravity happen to happen. Or at least we'll see if that's the case. I'm going to use an idea I call brutal simplicity. And this is just a guideline for where you should go and explore. Because in the long haul, simplicity wins. And it means you can reject things that happen to be too complicated. Be, not because you say, oh, this is where it's wrong, but because you say, I'm doing fundamental physics on fundamental things that aren't complicated. They're confusing, apparently, <laughs> but not complicated. But if you can make it too simple, hmm, not going to work out. And this was all these ones and zeros. Uh, you can kind of draw in space time and you go, oh, that can get kind of complicated pretty quickly because it can. So is general relativity simple? Well, look at the Lagrangian in a vacuum. A Lagrangian is all the ways energy can be interchanged. And we're saying it's only this R thing, which is actually the Ricci scalar. So it's all geometry, nothing else. That's simple. Now, this has been a good thing for general relativity. There are two ways in which general relativity has eliminated like nearly all the competition. One has to do with gravity waves. So if you have an isolated source, then it can wobble like a water balloon or higher order terms. And that's it. Cool. So then you say, well, I want a richer theory, so I'm going to add some more stuff. Well, it's almost as if you add anything to that, then you will have a dipole moment. And it's like, well, so? <laughs> The problem is experimentalists. They have measured uh, gravitational wave loss by binary pulsars, and they say, no, quadrupole has to be the lowest moment. If you predict a dipole, your proposal is wrong. 
and that eliminates a lot of proposals. Another issue, though, is that gravity bends light, you know, and light has no rest mass. You know, it's like the uncharged sort of thing. And so if you say, hold it, you know, Newton's law of gravity is so similar to Coulomb's law, I'm just going to do a variant. You can. And as a matter of fact, it's a good thing to do. It's uh, because it allows you to do calculations that would be like impossible to do any other way. Uh, there's this thing called the gravity probe B that, you know, only by using doing this sort of trick were you able to do the calculation because GR is just too darn hard. But that glosses over the deep differences between EM and uh, our approach to gravity. This cancellation isn't like casual. Einstein was the first to realize it's central to describing what gravity is about. The way I like to phrase it now is that gravity is about this symmetry. Stop. That's the whole thing. You have to find a symmetry that explains this situation. Okay, now let me ask the question again. <laughs> Is general relativity simple? Well, you've got the Ricci scalar. That's a contraction of the Ricci tensor. That's a contraction of the Riemann curvature tensor, which is not simple because that's the difference between derivatives of the Christoffel symbol of the second hind and the difference of two different products of Christoffel symbols, where a Christoffel symbol is a contraction of three different um, derivatives so that you have second order derivatives of metric tensors that transforms like a tensor, which it has to for Einstein's general relativity to work out. But that's not a simple thing, like, at all. Um, another issue, nonlinearity. Well, logically, it's absolutely necessary because a gravity field would gravitate. It would be a source of energy, and sources of energy are, is what gets um, the field uh, space-time to bend. But how about physically? Okay, linear, to me, means, like, you're off by yourself. You don't care about anybody else. Now, EM is wonderful. It's a linear theory. And it's 42 orders of magnitude stronger than gravity. That linear theory, 42 orders of magnitude. And now that, so the weak guy is now nonlinear physically. Remember, we're not just mathematics kind of people. We're mathematical physicists. And physically, I don't think that sounds reasonable. Hmm. <sighs> And now we got the big problem, general relativity. Does it play nicely with the rest of physics? Well, I wrote Einstein field equations and the Klein-Gordon equation because it was kind of a simpler one. A whole bunch of different uh, quantum mechanic equations I could have written there. But we can actually quantize uh, uh, the Einstein field equation. It's kind of a machinery sort of thing. It can be done. The problem is that once you're done, you say, and now let me do an actual calculation. That's where the problem comes in. And people have been working on that. Well, Einstein spent his entire second half of his life on it. And certainly Feynman gave it a, a try and a bunch of other people. Lots that weren't very famous. Nobody got it to work out. Hmm. So what have we been doing recently? Well, over the last 30 years, we've been going from like a four indices to 11, <laughs> just like spinal tap. It's like, oh my goodness. Imagine taking uh, <clears throat> taking that equation, um, the Klein-Gordon equation, going up to 11. That's got to be insane. Oh, and then you, then you have to compactify it. Um, and I think for brutal simplicity, we're not going to say where it's wrong. We're just saying it's too complicated. Look, those two equations in four dimensions are hard. And you're going to bring it up, uh, at least one of them up to 11? Uh, no, thank you. So hold it. What else can we do? Ah, it'd be simpler if we didn't have any of those Greek letters there. And you say, yeah, but doesn't that break everything? <laughs> uh, well, it does kind of say you can't use the Einstein field equations. 
realize I'm giving this talk to the uh, 22nd Eastern Gravity Meeting, uh, I'm losing 90% of the audience right then and there. Uh, and the other 10%, they're using their phone. So, <laughs> and uh, can you get Klein Gordon out if you remove the indices? I mean, I don't know how to do that. It just looks too radical. But I, what I would argue is, hmm, no, it's, it's more subtle than you might in, initially think. Uh, it's really an information rearrangement, not any kind of destruction of information. So, if we think about what dif differential geometry would do if you gave it to four vectors, what it does is it says, oh, there's 16 possibilities, and I'll put my metric tensor guys values uh, for each and every one of them in here, and there it is. Now, when you use these quaternions, you get the exactly the same 16 guys out there it's just that they're grouped in sets of four. See, differential geometry says, give me four and another four, and I'll give you one back. Whereas with no number theory, what happens is you start with two sets of four, and you get back a set of four. So it's an uh, automorphism. And nobody says, hey, look at this, the similarities between differential geometry and quaternions. So let's apply this rule, these rules of combining four sets of symbols together uh, to try and regenerate the Klein Gordon equation. And the odd thing that happens is that you get three more equations. Uh, so less is more. <laughs> so we do get the Klein Gordon equation as required. Uh, but we also get these mixed derivative terms. And I think that's a good thing because we want to tell a complete story, a full story. And if you just take, you know, two time derivatives and two space derivatives, you're just left with, well, why don't you take a uh, time and space derivative together? Well, that happens with quaternions. And here's a bit of speculation I have uh, about quantum field theory. So what is that in a broad picture. Well, what you do is you start with a field equation, and then you invert that equation, and that inverted equation is called a propagator that's actually used to do calculations. Now, most of our theories are gauge theories, and what that means is you can pick a gauge and proceed and everything goes fine. But until you pick that gauge, then it's actually possible that you that the, the thing can be like wiped out and you say, how do I invert a zero? And you go, you can't. <laughs> and uh, so it's kind of fundamentally broken. But as I say, we're used to dealing with that. It'd be nice if we didn't have to. And by having these three different equations out here, it's, it's my speculation that maybe that problem will just go away, which would be rather remarkable if there was any truth in it. And of course, this pattern is going to continue. In other words, if you have the Schrodinger equation, you're going to have three other equations. If you do the Dirac equation, you're going to have three mixed derivative kind of equations. All right, so now we're going to turn our uh, eyes back to gravity, and we're going to think about the symmetries of squaring things. And we're going to do this in two separate distinct geometric spaces. There's Minkowski space-time. That's where things are when. And then there is this energy momentum space. How much energy and momentum do those things you located in Minkowski spacetime have? So if you think about a ball in motion, okay, you've got to know where it is and when it is at that location, along with how fast is it going? Does it have a lot of energy? Does it have a lot of zip? When you do that and you say, what are the zeros? Well, in Minkowski space-time, the zeros is the light cone, and therefore the lines in there are all these hyperboles. In the affine space, you have the I ain't got no energy and I ain't got no momentum zeros, and therefore you have all these uh, sorts of hyperboles. Now, that t squared minus r squared is, is a real valued number. If it's positive, 
then it's the yellow region. If it's negative, then it's the purple region. For the space time, as for the energy momentum graph, that's an imaginary value. And the product of dt and dr, if it's um, positive, it's the light green. If it's negative, then it's, um, it's the dark green. It's just no more complicated than that. So the way I look at this pair of diagrams is that to do both classical physics and quantum mechanics, you need both spaces. You need to know where it is, what you're studying. You need to know what kind of energy and momentum it is that you're looking at. And both of those necessarily have these symmetries. The, the one in Minkowski space-time is known as the Lorentz group. That means there are three ways you can boost it. There are three ways you can rotate it. And the Poincaré symmetry is those symmetries plus translational symmetry. That means you can move it uh, from here to there and the, the equations stay the same. That happens in this uh, affine space, the dt and dr, because if you say, hey, hey sorry, r's over here, let's make it over here, and you go, yeah, and I, I don't see that when I do the dr, I subtract it away. One of the major impacts of this as a proposal is that there will be, like, no graviton. And that's not going to be so popular at the 22nd Eastern Gravity Meeting. Uh, but I think it's a pretty simple logical uh, consequence of the proposal because there is no like particle as associated with the ground rules of special relativity. Special ru ru rules of relativity are just that, you know? Um, okay, and now we've got a few more rules uh, that happen in the affine space, and that's the way it goes. Yeah, but are those rules going to be consistent with experimental tests of, uh, of, of gravity? And I think it's important to realize that when you solve the Einstein field equations, you are not done because you have constants from the integrations that go on there. And so it becomes an algebra point uh, problem at that after you've solved your nonlinear differential equations. Cool. All right. Now... The, what are the constraints that are used in in special in, in general relativity? You know, once to, to solve it, and it's like, well, they're exactly the same that I'm going to go over here. <laughs> so we're not changing the rules at all. So we've got uh, the rule that you know, if mass goes to zero, uh, that you've got to be like flat, and that it's got to be a function of m over r because it's uh, that's true for Newton's uh, law of gravity. Uh, you've got to be consistent with all these weak field tests. And I am adding another one, and that is that space times time is constant. It turns out that that's approximately true, and all I'm trying to do say is no, that's exactly true, um, and just going from there. All right, so that will, in fact, this exponential function, you know, when you've got the negative and the positive exponent, Moment. When they form the product, of course, it's going to uh, keep it constant as I require. And if you put in this gm over c squared r in for that z factor, that's actually consistent with the weak field tests uh, to first order uh, PPN accuracy. And it will actually differ at second order. So it is going to make a prediction that's different from general relativity. And that's, I consider it a, a wonderful thing. It means is I'm not trying to recreate the same thing. I clearly am not. I don't have field equations. <laughs> All right. Anyway, thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. Bye-bye. <laughs>